I'm going to talk about something kind of scary uh, that we're all kind of aware of, but it's something that we're not really losing sleep over. Um, but I'm not going to talk about the end of the world or how dangerously close we are to the cliff. Rather, I'm going to talk about people and a little thing called hope. But first, a story. So last week, I was in the sauna at the gym, and a woman walked in and started to complain about how cool the sauna was. Evidently, there had been an accident. Someone fell asleep and almost died, and the administration reacted by turning down the heat. Problem solved? Well, not for everyone. Uh, now you have to sit in the sauna twice as long to get a good sweat on. Uh, so this made me think about global warming and how we are all in this sauna called the atmosphere. Uh, it's still pretty cool, and we haven't really started to sweat. Uh, the heat is fueled by a system that basically eats up the planet, a system that would like to sell you a bowl of that frog stew once it's nice and boiled. Uh, but the change is incremental, it's slow, and it's hard to recognize, so we simply don't react. Uh, but some of us do, and contrary to what anyone says, it's not easy being green, because uh, being green means challenging the very system that feeds us, clothes us, and brings us to the tropical paradises, paradises that recover that help us recover from the exhausting buzz of the fluorescent lights and the cubicle work, and it, but it also promises higher standards of living for the Earth's growing population. But under the surface, we find fearless leaders who refuse to sink to the status quo, who soar to power in order to call attention to the problem of climate change. But getting the message across is a constant struggle. President Mohammed Nasheed told the United Nations, deep down, we know you're not really listening. Because when faced with the facts, our default is to build walls walls of denial, walls of empty promises, walls of false hope, and walls of sand and concrete. It's what we're good at, so we keep doing it. We hand this down to our children to worry about and to maintain. We're also good at war, so we approach it that way as well. So the ocean is the enemy, call in the troops, the Army Corps of Engineers. But we all know what happens to walls over time. They come crashing down. They might protect some for a while, but mostly they allow for business as usual. And ironically, in our effort to push the problem back, keep the sea from coming in, go about our lives, we create the conditions for an even greater and life-altering catastrophe. And I find it incredible that the ones emitting the most carbon into the atmosphere are not even the ones who are suffering the most. For decades, countries have attempted to come together under the framework of the United Nations to negotiate a treaty to curb carbon emissions. So imagine it this way. The most powerful players in the room are the ones who've been the most naughty, and we're asking them to put themselves in the corner for a timeout. Not likely. And it's easy to point the finger at China, but when you consider emissions per person, it's actually Americans who are responsible. And it's Americans who have been most irresponsible. So when typhoons come crashing down on the Philippines, it's the American lifestyle that's rearing its ugly head. And it's not an issue of personal freedom. What we have here is an issue of planetary injustice. Some of us have the luxury of denial and the ability to take risky bets on the planet. Elsewhere, climate change is just one more problem on the hazardous road of life. But no matter how you look at it, we are at a crossroads because time isn't static. We have to keep moving. We can't simply stop and let time and let the problem pass us by, although we should stop and smell the roses from time to time. Because I see something missing from this gloomy picture. I see people stepping up to protest um, and to protect the future inhabitants of this planet. Amazing people who, in recognizing the problem, are actively engaging to stop it. They call themselves the climate justice movement, and I'll get to them in just a minute. But first, I want to drive this metaphor home. So whether you have children or not, uh, you can all appreciate the role that a crossing guard plays. Maybe someone in here has served as one. Often the unsung hero, he or she makes sure that children get to school safely, protects them from all the crazy drivers on their way to work, the painted lines of the crosswalk aren't enough to fully protect children when the roads are rough. And of course, the road is not the same everywhere. Some children have to cross through floods, across collapsed suspension bridges, and obstacles unimaginable to get to school. This is the case throughout the developing world, where the impacts of climate change are being felt the most. And in many parts of the world, we need crossing guards who can swim children to safety. I see the climate justice movement as a planet-wide guard, crossing guard for the future. Climate justice can mean many things, and I tend to think of it as a meaningful action taking to deal with the most pressing problem of the 21st century, climate change. And to a large extent, this means moving the planet toward a low-carbon, sustainable, equitable, and deeply democratic future. And this movement mainly consists of young people. In the words of Julia Butterfly Hill, tree activist and tree sitter, more and more young people are having to give up youthful innocence in pursuit of saving their very future from the hands and decision makers of those who are destroying it. It is a profoundly powerful testament to these same young people that are not that not only are they willing to do this, but they are doing so with such clarity, commitment, and creativity. So this book highlights just a handful of actions that young people are pursuing to save the planet. 
and um, this includes activists like Andy Ridley, the co-founder of Earth Hour, Wen Bo, the founder of China's Greenpeace, Benjamin Potts, uh, who you might know from Sea Shepherd and Whale Wars and others. Um, and it just highlights a variety of things. But what's clear about this is that a new generation is coming forward in their battles, they're paving survival in the dawn of this new and challenging century. Uh, Tim De Christopher, an activist in prison for nearly two years for simply holding up a bidding sign at an auction that was parceling land off to fossil fuel companies, wrote in his sentence hearing the following words. At this point of unimaginable threats on the horizon, this is what hope looks like. In these times of a morally bankrupt government that has sold out its principles, this is what patriotism looks like. With countless lives on the line, this is what love looks like, and it will only grow. Einstein once said, we can't solve our problems with the same thinking that we use when we created them. I think that what this means for climate justice and climate change is that we need creative thinking. We need reimagining. Desmond Tutu said, youth are uniquely equipped to change the world because they dream. They choose not to accept what is, but to imagine what might be. So let me return to my story about the sauna. The lower temperature sparked controversy and the heat was turned up, but unlike the atmosphere, a sauna is supposed to be hot. So I hope that the next time you enjoy a sauna or stop to let children cross the street, that you daydream about the future. There's still time to change things. It's not yet the end of the world. Another world is not only possible, it's on its way. Thank you.